Uh, Turn with me, please, to these opening verses of Daniel chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 1 to 4a. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this gift of your word. You tell us that the entrance of your word brings light. So, Father, may you give us the eyes to see the light of your grace and truth in your word. Help us to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Help us to see Jesus to come and bow before him as our God and our Saviour. Amen. At the time of speaking, it's not clear how long our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is going to last in office. It may be that this time next week we have a new Prime Minister. It may be that there will be a general election in a few months' time and we will have a new government, but time will tell. But one thing is sure, even if we get a new prime minister and a new government, it will be made up of people like you and me, flawed human beings, people like us who often fail to be faithful to our word or live up to our promises. Because if we are honest with ourselves, we do not always live up to our own standards, let alone the standards others expect of us. We let ourselves down and we let others down. And if we cannot live up to our own standards or the standards that others expect of us, how much more, how much more do we fail to live up to the high and holy standards of our great and awesome God? We may kid ourselves, but there's no kidding God. God tells us in his word that we all have sinned, all of us, and fallen short of his glory at Romans 3, 23. And that is why one of the main messages of the Old Testament That part of the Bible which prepares us for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and shows us our need of the Lord Jesus Christ as a saviour. That's why one of the main messages of the Old Testament is this. You are unfaithful, but God is faithful. Therefore, trust God. You are unfaithful, but God is faithful. Therefore, trust God. Trust God. That's the message that comes loud and clear through the Old Testament tannoy. Trust God. Not yourself. Not your feelings. Not what others say in social media or YouTube. Not the shifting sands of popular opinion. No, trust God. The God of whom the psalmist says, and we had this as our call to worship, you, God, power belongs to you, God, and with you is unfailing love. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. Psalm 62, verse 11 and 12. And you see, it is this God, this powerful God of unfailing love, who calls out to us, to each of us today, from the book of Daniel. To trust him. To listen to him. To obey him. To worship him. Because he is faithful, and we are not. And this is the God whom Daniel worships, the faithful God, the powerful God, the loving God, the God who is in control despite appearances and whatever our circumstances. The God who is in control, whether it's, whether it's the Babylonians in power or Boris, whether it's Putin or the Persians, the God who is sovereign and in control despite appearances and whatever the circumstances Now, in Daniel chapter 9, as we said earlier, Daniel's now an old man in his early 80s, but when he was a teenager back in Jerusalem, he would have known of and possibly heard for himself the prophet Jeremiah. And we read in Jeremiah 25, verses 3 and 4, where in the year 605 BC, just before the first wave of exiles were carried off to Babylon, including Daniel and his friends, Jeremiah spoke these words, From the word of the Lord, he spoke the word of the Lord for 23 years. The word of the Lord has come to me and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. 23 years without a response, without a convert. But there's a warning here for some of you because it wasn't just 23 years, was it? It was longer than that with the different prophets that God had sent to the northern kingdom of Israel as well as the southern kingdom of Judah. But for some of you, how many of you have sat for 23 years and maybe longer under the word of God? 
and have not responded to what God is saying. Not in the way that the word of God demands. You have continued to live life your own way, to do your own thing, worship your own gods. Do you not know that it is a dreadful thing for a sinner, an unforgiven sinner, to fall into the hands of the living God? Do you think it is a light thing to sin against God and reject his mercy and forgiveness? Do you think it is a light thing to ignore the great love God has shown you in sparing you thus far, but not sparing his only son? My friend, if that describes you, you are playing with fire. And if you do not seek God's forgiveness for you in Jesus Christ, one day you will approach the blazing fire of God's holiness with your clothes still soaked with the petrol of unforgiven sin. And so Jeremiah goes on, verse 8, Therefore the Lord Almighty says this, Because you have not listened to my words, I will summon Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The whole country, verse 11, will become a desolate wasteland. And you will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation and will make it desolate forever. So there is here a note of hope beyond the period of judgment and exile. Babylon will not be top dog forever. But there's more, isn't there, in the prophecy as we saw earlier. It's not just that Babylon will be defeated as it was by the Persian Empire in 539 BC. It is that God has promised to bring his people back to the promised land. Jeremiah 29 verse 10, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from captivity. Now here's the question, where is this hope found? Where is this note of hope found? It is found in the word of God. It is found in the word of the Lord. And when we enter the gates of Babylon, and the year is now 539, 538 BC, we see an old man, a wise old man, searching the scriptures, reading the word of God. The word of the Lord through Jeremiah. So look at Daniel 9, verse 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a maid by descent who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, from the books, the holy books, according to the word of the Lord's given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. There's a change of regime, a change of government, a change of, a whole change in Babylon. You can imagine it's not just the top of change. They would change everything, different way of doing things. Time of change, Daniel, he doesn't look for a dream or for a vision. Maybe that's understandable given the fact that when he's had dreams in the past, he's been left pretty shaken by them. But he doesn't ask for a dream. He doesn't look for a vision. He searches the scriptures. He looks to the word of God. What is God saying to us in these times of change, in these times of uncertainty? And that is a good lesson for us to learn. What is God saying to us in this time of COVID? Are you going to know that? Well, search the scriptures. You may not find a specific prophecy that deals with COVID, but you will find plenty of truth in the Bible that tells you what God may well be saying to us in a time like this. A time when people are faced with death and asking questions about how death can be avoided or defeated. A, a time when people are isolated and realizing actually we're made for relationship. A time when people are looking for hope 
And the Bible points us to, to all these things. We're going to be thinking about that, I think, tonight in the Passion for Life. All these three areas, doesn't it? The Bible has the answer to the curse of death through Jesus Christ. The Bible has the answer. We're made in the image of God, who is a relational God. Therefore, we are made for relationship with him and with each other. That God gives us hope. In the face of uncertainty, in the face of death, in the light of eternity. Daniel is looking for God's view of things in the situation he finds himself in. And that's a good thing for us to do. It's so easy. It's so easy to be dominated by what we're hearing from the news, wherever you get your source of information from, whether it's online or the TV or the papers, wherever. But you know, as they say, if you're reading the newspaper on one hand, you should read the Bible in the other. What is God's view? What's the big picture? What is God saying to us in this? The Lord has promised his people to give them a hope and a future. He's going to bring us back from captivity. Can you imagine Daniel reading this? Restoring our fortunes. He's gathering, he's going to gather us from the places he has scattered us to. And what does Daniel say? Fantastic, I can just sit back and relax. The Lord has promised, so it will surely happen. I will put my AirPods in, I'll put my heads, headphones on and chill out to some cool Sam music. But that's not what Daniel does. I turned, verse 3, so I so. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting, sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Daniel takes the word of God and turns it into prayer. Daniel takes the promises of God and turns them into prayer, as we were saying earlier with the, the children. But you see, how does, God, how does God cross the bridge? If we may put it like this, how does God cross the bridge between what he promises and bringing about what he promises? Or to put it another way, what, what bridge does God use to cross from the place where he makes a promise to the place where that promise is fulfilled? Well, it's not the Keswick Bridge. Though some folks might think North Keswick is the promised land where promises are answered, I don't know. It's not the Keswick Bridge, but it is the bridge of his people's prayers. The bridge God often uses, he doesn't need to use them, but the bridge he often chooses to use are the prayers of his people. You see that? God promises. He hears the prayers of his people using the promises, and the promises are answered. Now, I want us to think about what that means for us today, that God uses our prayers to fulfill his promises. Um, now, earlier this year, we touched on it, I think, just briefly with the kids. Genesis 22, the story of Isaac and Abraham offering up his one and only son, and then there was a ram caught in the bushes that took Isaac's place. We think of God as the Lord who will provide. And we saw how the Lord provides everything we need, both spiritually, including a substitute for our sins, not a ram caught by its horns in the thicket, but Jesus, the Lamb of God, who dies in our place. But not just a substitute for our sins. Along with Christ, he has promised to give us all things we need for life and godliness. He has promised also to give us materially what we need. That is there in Scripture. Not what we want, but what we need. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you. Paul writing from his Roman prison cell to the church in Philippi. My God will meet all your needs, all your needs, according to the glory of his riches in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4 verse 19. Let me ask you, as I ask myself, what should we do with these promises of God? We should use them in our prayers. Learn to use them in our prayers. And I, I don't know about you, maybe you already do that, but I need to do that so much. So many times during the day, these promises I know, but I need to use them. 
to trust them and to pray them. Now, I'll not go over everything I said about George Muller earlier, who, through prayer, saw many, many, many hundreds of answers to specific prayers. He prayed the promises of God. He prayed, Lord, you are the Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will provide. Lord, he used that verse from Philippians 4, my God will meet all your needs according to the glories of his riches in Christ Jesus. He prayed these prayers on many, many times. There were incidents where the, there was no food. And in one case, at this stage, the orphanage had 300 children. And he had staff to help him as well. Now, remember that Muller had decided he wasn't going to ask anybody for help apart from the Lord. And this is the 19th century. There's no social security. There's no government help. So one day in the orphanage, they had run out of food. 300 children. Do you hear this story, boys and girls? Do you want to hear this story? Do you remember George Miller, the man who ran the home for the boys and girls? There were 300 children. That's about all. Is that all the pupils? That, that's more, well, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of children, isn't it? 300. They had run out of food. No food. It was breakfast time. Have you ever come down for your breakfast in the morning? There's been no food. Amelia's, Amelia's saying yes, Caroline. Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. I think there's been food somewhere. But there was no food in the, the orphanage. George Muller prayed to God and thanked God for the food they were about to eat. There was no food, no bread, no milk, nothing. Just at that moment, there was a knock on the door. And who do you think was standing outside the door? It was a baker. What does a baker do? Bakes bread and he had a big load of bread. He said, this is for you. And George Miller goes, Ow. and the baker says, God woke me in the middle of the night and told me to bake more bread than I normally bake and bring it to you. So George Muller said thank you and took the bread into the children, into the orphanage. And he just sat down when he heard another knock at the door. And who was it this time? It was the milkman. And in those days the milkman had a horse and a cart and the milk was in big metal containers and a churn, a milk churn in the cart. And you know what had happened to the cart? The wheel was broken on the cart. So now, what do you think he's going to do with a wheel that was broken in the cart? He was going to try and get it fixed. But you know what he said? If I leave my cart to try and get the wheel fixed, the wheel mended, someone will steal all this milk. So I've decided I'm just going to give it to you. Now think about that. The cart had broken down just outside the orphanage. The milkman said, I can't go away and get someone to fix this wheel because I'm scared all the milk will be taken. I'm just going to give it to the orphanage. So the 300 boys and girls had bread and milk and enough for breakfast. Because George Muller prayed the promises of God. God crossed the bridge of that prayer from his promise to the place for he answered his promise. The Lord will provide. That is his promise. So let us learn with Muller to turn that promise into prayer. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Take that promise and turn it into a prayer. Take the promise of Jesus that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Take that promise and turn it into prayer. Build your church, Lord. Take the promise of God that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take that promise and turn it into a prayer, especially if you've never prayed it before. Lord, this is your promise. To cleanse me from all unrighteousness when we confess our sins before you. Take every promise of God and turn them into prayer. And if you're not yet a believer, I beg you, take the promise of God that he has loved you so much that he has sent Jesus into this world that whoever believes in his one and only Son will not perish, 
but have everlasting life. Take that promise and turn it into prayer. Lord, you have said that whoever believes in your Son will not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, help me to believe. I want to believe. I want to know the gift of everlasting life. Pray in the light of the promise of Jesus who says, Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Isn't that a precious promise? Whoever comes to me, whoever means whoever you are, doesn't it? Yes, Daniel 9 will show us that there is a proper way to come in confession and repentance, of course, and David will maybe speak more to that next week. Of course there is. But if we come seeking God's mercy and forgiveness in Christ, whoever comes to Christ, he will never turn away. Never! Whatever you have done, Well, the Bible is full of magnificent promises, isn't it? So many, so, so many. We could go on. My word will not return to me empty, but accomplish for me the purpose for which I send it out. Lord, keep your word. May the word be fruitful. And here's a thing, boys and girls, and all of us. The Bible is full of so many promises that there's, there's even a promise. There's even a promise about all the promises isn't that right? There's even a promise about all the promises. For God has said in his word in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, no matter how many promises God has made, they are, what is it? They are, yes, in Christ. No matter how many promises God has made, they are, yes, in Christ. A promise. Do you see what that is? That's a promise about the promises. Jesus is the one in whom all the promises of God are guaranteed and fulfilled. No extra purchase is necessary. You know, you know particularly if you buy something electronic like a toaster or a radio or a microwave or something, they'll say, no, if you just give me 30 pounds more, we'll extend the guarantee from one year to five years. And if you're wise, you'll say, no, thanks. But with Christ, you do not need to pay anything extra for the guarantee. The free gift of Christ comes with its own guarantee because he is the guarantee. He's not only the gift of life, he is the guarantee of that gift. Because all the promises that God has made, including John 3.16 and all these other promises that we've referred to, are all yes in Jesus Well, let me close with some words from Spurgeon. Came across this a few days ago. Spurgeon is commenting on a verse in 2 Samuel 7, verse 25. And if you know that chapter, 2 Samuel 7, God has promised David amazing promises. David was saying, I'm going to build a house for the Lord. I'm going to build a temple. Then God sent Nathan and said, no, no, David, you're not going to build a house for me. I'm going to build a house for you. A kingdom, a throne that will last forever. So how does David respond to that promise? He turns it into a prayer. And he says in 2 Samuel 7 verse 25, Do as you have said. Do as you have spoken. Do as you have promised. And Spurgeon says this, God's promises were never meant to be thrown aside as waste paper. God intended that they should be used. God's gold is not miser's money, but is minted to be traded with. Nothing pleases our Lord better than to see his promises put into circulation. He loves to see his children bring them up to him and say, Lord, do as you have said. We glorify God when we plead his promises. Our heavenly banker delights to cash his own notes. God loves to hear the cries of needy souls. It is his delight to bestow favors. He is more ready to hear than you are to ask. The sun is not weary of shining, nor the fountains of flowing. It is God's nature to keep his promises. Therefore, go at once to his throne and say, Do as you have said. Amen. Let's pray.